Welcome to Entrepreneurs in Healthcare. I've come to realize that entrepreneurship discussions are long overdue in medicine. I'm pairing up with voices from healthcare that value entrepreneurship and that are willing to come on the screen with me and hold a discussion. I'm hoping that hosting these conversations will open up pathways to making progress in medicine and not making entrepreneurship a bad word. Join along on the series as we dissect entrepreneurship, healthcare, and everything in between. excited to be welcoming Dr. Laura Hockman to the virtual stage. Dr. Hockman, can you uh, let us know who you are? Yes, thank you so much for having me, Donna. I'm Laura Hockman. I'm the medical matchmaker, family medicine physician, and CEO and founder of Happy Day Health, where I help physician-owned private practices match with physicians that are ready to take the leap and join a private practice. And I work with some non-clinical physicians as well. I like that. I like that you called yourself medical matchmaker, and we can certainly hop into that. But first, the question of the hour. <laughs> Entrepreneurship in healthcare, is it good or bad? Well, that is a multifaceted question. Um, in general, I would say entrepreneurship is good. I think entrepreneurship is where we really are able to find new ways of doing things and to come up with better ways and find that autonomy and that voice that many of us in medicine have either lost or at some point lost and have found back. Um, on a personal level, um, entrepreneurship can be great and it can be not so great. So it really just all depends on the person. So, you know, I, and even within the same person, it can be both. I mean, I, love entrepreneurship. I would have never imagined myself in this position. Um, and yet, you know, it definitely has its pros and its cons. Um, and it's not something that anyone should take lightly. But overall, as far as, you know, physician autonomy and physicians taking back medicine, um, I think entrepreneurship is vital. So let's talk about that for a second, because I think that you hit on a not only a key word, but you struck a nerve with me and I'm sure with people that are going to be listening and that's taking back medicine. So can you explain a little bit more uh, what you mean by taking back medicine and how entrepreneurship fits in? Oh, for sure. So, you know, 20 years ago, most physicians were in private practice. Most medicine was practiced by doctors who owned their own practice. Now, you know, 80 or 90% of doctors are working for a big system. Um, because of that, we don't have the voice, we don't have the negotiating power, and we're just at the mercy of the insurance companies, the hospital systems, the administrators. We don't have the, um, we don't have that voice in medicine anymore. Um, I, I really think that, um, you know, it's so important as physicians to be able to get that back um, and I don't believe we're going to do that if we're if we're working for the big systems. I believe that we are going to make that difference when we step out of our comfort zones and start our own practices. We um, we learn to set boundaries. We say no. We do what we know is best for ourselves and the patients. Um, I think that's how we get medicine back to being between the doctor and the patient, and not all the fifty people in between us and the insurance companies. Um, I think that's all why we, well, I know that's why we almost all went into medicine and um, the lack of having that is why many of us are leaving. And do you think that private practice is one of those solutions? Yes, I think private practice is important. Um, and I want to, I want to, you know, take 50 steps back here and just say, you know, where I grew up, I didn't grow up in the United States. Um, back there, the physician charged what they felt they needed to charge for the visit. So, um, you know, just say they wanted to get paid $50 for a visit. 
the patient would pay and then the patient would then go and submit that to ins the insurance companies. Um, and so the patient knows for every visit, I'm going to be reimbursed X amount. Now, the doctor can either pay insurance rates or they can pay more than insurance rates and the patient knows what they're going to get. Um, I, You know, when I think about an ideal situation, I don't think there's anything ideal for every type of person. And, you know, there's obviously going to be many solutions needed for everything. But when I think about that and how it and how that system worked where I grew up, you know, if if we as the doctor's offices here in the U.S. are calling the insurance companies constantly to fight with them and, you know, we have to hire people to do this and therefore, you know, so many of us are going out of practice because of that, um, they it's just not something we can do. It's driving doctors out of medicine for various reasons. I mean, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the factors versus each patient is going to be calling and, and bugging the insurance companies. That's going to have a big effect by trying to handle that gigantic volume. Um, also, doctors are going to be getting paid what they feel like they need to get paid to run their practice. Let me ask you something. You mentioned another country. I'm assuming that's South Africa because I know you're from there. Okay. So is it easier in South Africa for the patient to submit their um, bill, like to, for reimbursement? We'll be right back. Hey everyone, Dr. Donna Coriel here from SoMeDocs. I am so excited to be presenting the new student section of SoMeDocs. Over at doctorsonsocialmedia.com, we've already got a doctor section that is alive and thriving and growing. And we now have a brand spanking new student section where we're welcoming students in and they get a ton, ton of perks for a very low price. We invite all of you out there who are medical students or pre-medical students who want to increase your networking circles, who want to be given opportunities to grow in the medical field. And so many perks come with our student membership. Please check it out at doctorsonsocialmedia.com slash membership. I cannot wait to see more students be a part of our venture. Back to our episode. Is it easier in South Africa for the patient to submit their um, bill, like to, for reimbursement? Do you know? I can't speak to what it is now. I can speak to what my experience as a child was. You know, really, it was my parents doing it, but they didn't really have any issues with it as far as I know. I do know when I went to visit uh, South Africa uh, 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago, I had to go to the emergency room. Um, I was pregnant. I had severe abdominal pain, couldn't get off the floor. So, you know, a little bit scary to a pregnant woman. And it was so interesting because before I could, they let me into the emergency room. They pulled out their credit card machine and they're going to be, they said, this is going to be X amount of dollars. I paid, they let me in. Then they said, the doctor said, I want to order these labs. Someone came in, I paid, and then they drew my blood. Same thing. I got an ultrasound. I paid and then I got the ultrasound. Wow. And at the end, um, I knew exactly what I was going to be billed. I could say yes or no. You know, there's so much surprise billing in the U.S. The cost was significantly lower in part because the, uh, you know, the, the dollar is much stronger than that currency, but also because there were there weren't as many middlemen. Um, and I think that makes a huge difference. So. I can't speak to what it is today, but um, but it was not an issue. Like it just wasn't that you know that the insurance so company will pay this amount. You pay the receipt, and that's that. That's so interesting because the follow up question was going to be whether it was expensive at the end of the day. So it sounds like it wasn't pricey. It was reasonable cost, right? Wow, and there was actual transparency, which is <laughs> refreshing to hear about. Yeah. You know, in a day and age, in this country at least, where there's so much opaqueness and lack of transparency that we don't really know what things cost and we're constantly confused about the process just in general. So that's really interesting that that's how we're... So it's not socialized medicine then over there. 
No. Right. Because that's not what social medicine, socialized medicine is about. It's just like a capitalistic system of, and yet, again, and yet it was reasonable prices. So what happens to people there that, that or you might not know the answer to this, but I'm curious what happens to people there that maybe can't afford those prices? They still have hospitals that are the, you know, like we have uh, okay. for uninsured. So there's care. options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So this is great. I would really love to hear like other instances of healthcare and what works there, what doesn't, you know, work there um, so that we can really dissect the models that work and why they work. Um, but taking it back to the whole concept of an entrepreneur, um, what are what are the bad instances when where entrepreneurship is taken on in a bad way by a doctor? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, there's a few ways. I think one of the ways, and I definitely fell prey to this one, is that as physicians, we are very type A and we tend to be workaholics and um, a, a lot of us don't feel like we have the choice to say no. Um, we can work ourselves to death. I mean, you know, when I started my company, I was working in the morning before my kids woke up. I would work while they're at school. I would pick them up from school. I would work when they got home. I'd work at night. Like it was crazy. And I used to joke that I'm the worst boss ever. Like I used to, I used to go to the gym and kind of grumble to my people like, my boss sucks. I hate my boss. And it was me. Like at one point when they found out it was me, they were like, wait, you've been talking about yourself this whole time? Like, yes. Oh, I'm the worst boss ever to myself. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, uh, I, I think in that sense, if you don't know how to dig your way out of that, that is tough. Um, I've definitely learned. I sleep until I'm done sleeping. I'm done when my kids are done with school. I've made it work for me. But I think that that is a way that we can really struggle as entrepreneurs is learning when to turn off. In any business, you can just work until, I mean, there's just no end. Um, that's one of the ways I think personally for yourself and your family life, that's not good. Even if you love what you do, you need to have some balance. Um, other ways is that entrepreneurship is not going to be financially rewarding for the beginning it could be the first year the first three years who knows um you know if I put these hours into being a doctor I'd be a gajillionaire by now <laughs> so if you're if you're starting a business because you have a passion for something and you want to change something that's amazing but from a financial standpoint you need to make sure that it's something you can do or that you're comfortable taking the hit um and I think all of us that have done some sort of business or other have have um experience that at some point. Do you think it's easier if doctors actually take on an entrepreneurial mindset and learn about entrepreneurial um, ventures and the possibilities that are out there um, early on? Meaning, do you think it would benefit us as a profession if we taught entrepreneurship earlier on rather than start taking on this concept as attendings? Yes, absolutely. Not even a question. I think that all of us should learn in, you know, as, as far back as medical school, what it takes to run a practice, what it takes to lobby. I mean, there's so many things that we should be doing that we're too busy taking care of patients to do. And I think that's a part of why we got into this mess. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely think we need to be learning that, not just the mindset, but the mindset, how to run a practice, what you're looking at, what problems do we run into, you know, making mistakes is such an important part of entrepreneurship and gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we could learn from each other's mistakes in medical school before we start our practice. Uh, so yeah, I definitely think that's something we should be learning very early on. Totally. I know that I didn't learn it in my own medical school training, not to say that there was like extra time to twiddle our thumbs, but certainly having learned you know, entrepreneurship and marketing and maybe coding and some things that are relevant to actually practicing in the U.S. would have probably been beneficial to me. And is probably why, is probably what has fueled me to open a student section in Somi Docs is really to connect with these students and to show them that there are, um, there are topics that they can learn that are not necessarily part of the curriculum they're presented with. Do you think that um, private practice 
building is something that's complicated? Do you think that it is a lot to take on? Do you think there's ways to make it simpler? It is a lot to take on. That being said, we are doctors. We can do it. Um, we are very smart people. We can learn this. Um, one of the things that we like as physicians is having things set up in a way that makes it easy for us to learn. And I don't mean easy, easy. I mean, like, you know, here's the step, do this, learn this, you know, we learn from textbooks and we learn from watching people. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's something doable that, I mean, sadly, the easiest way to do it is to not take insurance because that takes out a huge chunk of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, resources out there. One of them is our conference we have coming up um, on starting your own private practice, but there's things to know, you know, as far as what you need to know legally, how to set it up for success financially, how to market. Um, and a lot of that is on Somi Docs. Um, but yes, they are definitely resources that we can find um, that are so important to help us. We don't necessarily need to use all the resources, but they certainly make it easier for sure. You touched on something that I definitely want to talk about, and that's the private practice resource. We do on SomiDocs have a private practice section. You can find it through our directories. Um, there's a section called topics, but in it, you and I are building a private practice conference. So I want to talk about that a bit because I think it's like a no brainer for anybody that's listening to this, that this could be of use to, especially since we made a recent change that made it no brainer. So can you tell me, let's start with why is a private practice resource like this, a conference, a live event like this, why is it beneficial and why do we need it as a profession? Well, the conference itself is going to be huge. I don't mean huge as in huge. I mean, it's going to be hugely important, I should say. Um, it really breaks it down into the basics and what you need to know. Um, and we have experts from you know, a bunch of different fields coming. We have doctors who've started their own practice who are coming to speak. And, you know, I think it'll do a bunch of things. One, you can learn from it. You can learn what's needed to start a practice. Um, number two, it should be able to break down that fear to see, oh my gosh, other people have done it. I can too. And here are the steps that I need to do it. Um, the other thing, you know, there's going to be the Facebook group where we can ask questions and get them answered live. Um, it, it's going to be really good. It's free. So you have absolutely nothing to lose except your time, which will be very well spent. Um, and so, you know, I really think it'll be a great conference for anyone wanting to go into private practice, anyone curious about what private practice entails or what, what's needed to start a private practice. Um, so, I mean, definitely everyone should sign up. It's free right up until the event afterwards, you know, for a pretty low fee, you can purchase it. And, um, and for, uh, you know, there's CME available with a purchased, purchased, um, membership. What do you call it? Yeah. Ticket. ticket. No, totally. Ticket. Purchase ticket. Right. So what went into the decision? I, and, and I'm saying this as obviously the founder and creator of Somi Docs, but you know, I partner up with different chairs for with you, for example, to run a private practice conference. And I really do um, respect your decision making and, and, and want the chairs really to ultimately decide how they want this um, to play out uh, according to their vision. So in this case, what persuaded you to make this event, which clearly we've spent so much time building, I know because I've spent it with you, right? Um, what convinced you to sort of make it from a ticket purchase access event where we priced it originally at $249, which I think was extremely fair, right? Compared to other conferences that are being held live nowadays that are oftentimes in the thousands of dollars worth. What convinced you to make it free while it's live? Quite a few things. You know, we really at the core of what we do, it's really all comes down to physician advocacy. And as we were talking about at the beginning is helping doctors to take medicine back and to get our voice. Um, and by making it free, we're overcoming that barrier that so many of us as physicians, we're frugal, we're doctors. <laughs> uh, so I really hope that people can come and learn something and 
uh, really, really get something out of it. And of course, I'd like to, you know, make our money back. Um, but at its at its root of why we're doing it, it all comes down to we just want to help out and be part of the change. Yeah, I think that I totally relate to this. I think that at the end of the day, promoting autonomy is so important for me, um, for you. I think for a lot of people that are listening, our autonomy just seems like it's such a faraway concept. And yet our colleagues are starting to build their own practices and starting to kind of go off on their own. And it's still such a faraway concept for so many doctors out there that it almost feels like we must like build this kind of resource and bring together people that have done it in a structured way, meaning this is a conference. It's a serious conference. This is not just a chit chatty little event where we're just getting together to chit chat. Although networking is probably going to be a big part of this conference. So um, as the chair and as the person that curated it and decided who was going to be taken on a speaker and who wasn't, what went into those decision to that decision making? A few things. I was looking for people who, number one, would be engaging and you know are experts and know what they're talking about. Um, but also, it came down to what will be most valuable. There were some people that approached us and said, "Hey, can I speak?" And there were some people that I approached and said, "Hey, I'd love you to come speak about X, Y, Z." Um, and, and they're all the things that I thought, well, these are things that people really need to know. I mean, we even, you know, we talk about finances and we talk about legal stuff and we talk about, um, you know, the different types of practice, micro practice and, and direct primary care and all of that. Um, but we even talk about how to preserve your marriage if you're starting a business. Um, and so really deciding on those topics came from in part, things that I wish I had known when I started my own business. Um, and in part, just things that are, well, you have to know this. So many doctors that I speak to um, in Happy Day Health, they either don't have never heard of direct primary care. They don't even know that something like a micro practice exists. Um, they're so daunted by the task of starting a practice. Um, these are the things that I hear scare people or they say, I don't even know what I don't know. So I just put that together for them so that now they know what they don't know. <laughs> and they'll have most of the answers and know where to go for those answers. I so, so yeah, it, it really should be pretty comprehensive as far as all of that goes. Um, I really wanted to make it a conference that works. And, and part of the decision to even make the conference, you know, when I speak with my, the practices I work with that where I'm helping them to find a physician to join them, um, they all say, gosh, I don't know why doctors wouldn't be in private practice. They're like, they just don't even understand. They say, this is so much better. And so many of them were employed before and know what they were in and know what they're in now. And it's just a no brainer to them. They just, they're like, I don't get it. I'm offering them autonomy. I don't get it. Um, but I think on the other side, they don't get it either. You know, you don't know what you don't know. So. Absolutely. And I mean, I, spent that little segment when you were talking, thinking about several questions. So I'm trying to just kind of recall them. They were all really good. Um, the first sort of focused on speaking. Um, it's an interesting question that I have to ask you, and maybe I'll preface it with a little commentary. Um, I know that even as entrepreneurs, right, you and I are entrepreneurial. Um, we have an entrepreneurial mindset in building this conference. Um, we decided that we were going to pay our speakers, but you know, there's plenty of both conferences and little jobs and little, basically instances that require physician time that isn't necessarily compensated. Where I'm going with this is that today I saw a LinkedIn post that was shared by a physician who's wonderful, by the way, not going to give away their name, but was saying that they chose not to take on a specific role um, because they felt like they deserved compensation and they, you know, would not do it for free. And I've seen so much written about this. I'm just curious about starting that conversation and see where, like, where you're at headwise in terms of doing speaking engagements and maybe other little 
odds and end jobs for free. I think a lot of very different things depending on the circumstance. Um, if you're wanting to get better at speaking, you may not be getting paid monetarily, but you're getting paid with the practice. You can't be a good speaker the first time you got on stage. I can tell you about my first experience and it was terrible, terrible. Um, but now, you know, I'm so comfortable speaking. I could stand up in a stadium and speak. I don't, I don't care. One person, 10,000 people, no big deal. Um, I mean, I definitely have my hangups there, but as far as practice goes, you're going to get the practice. If you're someone who's already an experienced speaker um, and you're very sought after, then of course you should get paid, not even a question. Um, I think you get something out of every, every experience, whether it's money or an experience. And, you know, there's going to be different things that you get out of that. Um, I do think that as physicians, we fall into the trap of um, people pleasing and doing things for free, for sure. And so we need to be very aware of that and have our boundaries and be able to say no. Um, but also you want to know what you're saying no to. You know, there are certain things that I will speak for free at, for sure, but there are many things that I will not speak for free at because why I wouldn't. <laughs> so, you know, it really depends on the person, the circumstance and what you're hoping to get out of it. There are, there's free events that I've spoken at where I made money because I, something else came of it, which I wasn't even doing it for exposure. I was just like, I think this will help people. And turns out I indirectly did earn some money from it. So I think that there are um, so many different circumstances to, to speaking for free. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. In fact, I wrote an article to that end, um, you know, because I did see, you know, some advice in one Facebook group or, or another that was so general and it was so sort of like, um, I don't know, it was so boxed in. It was kind of like, I saw an interaction where it was like someone said that they, you know, weren't getting paid. And then someone was like, absolutely not. Like, you know, you should be getting paid for what you're worth. And I absolutely agree with that. At the same time, like we can't give such a general advice all the time. If we don't know the specific circumstances. I mean, what is, you know, there's so many factors that go into a decision of on your time, right? And you almost sometimes, if you can't do it yourself, where you have like a positive uh, side and a negative side where you can write out all the positives of taking on, a, you know, a gig versus not taking on a gig. If you can't do that the, yourself, then maybe you can do it with others, with friends, with loved ones, with trusted ones, with consultants and advisors. Um, but it's kind of not a one size fits all solution and answer. So I'm with you. And I agree with you that I come from the same place. It depends on the gig, like what's the exposure like, um, you know, what's the return? The return could be multifold and not necessarily in immediate financial return. So I love that answer. I am so excited even just thinking through like all the speakers that we have coming. I mean, I know that we even have a lawyer that's joining us that is focusing on, she does, you know, physician contracts. She's not only really great, but I actually had the privilege of seeing her live in a conference in Chicago where I spoke and she spoke as well and she was captivating. So I don't know, I guess this is a good time to shout out Amanda Hill for taking part in our um, conference. And let me ask you this, do you see in the future the option for um, a lot of these non-doctors to kind of, I don't know, get involved with the doctors and helping us to promote our autonomy? Let's take a break. I couldn't be more proud to be featuring another virtual conference that SomiDocs is hosting. This one is called Private Practice 101, Starting Your Own. And it is going live virtually May 31st through June 2nd of 2024. The best, best part of this, besides the fact that there's an expert lineup that we have curated to you, chaired by Dr. Laura Hockman, is that this conference is going to be accessible even after it goes live. So attendees get access for six months to the content and we welcome 
all of you in. We are pricing our tickets nice and low so that everybody can afford it. We're pairing it up with CME. We are making sure that it is accessible. So again, it is live and virtual. So you can attend from your own living room in your pajamas. You don't have to take any planes to get there. You don't have to rent hotel rooms. Don't have to be away from your family. You can soak up all of our goodies regardless of where you are. I hope to see you there. Back to our episode. Do you see in the future the option for um, a lot of these non-doctors to kind of, I don't know, get involved with the doctors and helping us to promote our economy? Oh, I think we need the non-doctors for sure. Amanda Hill, who you mentioned, is a lawyer who is deeply involved in physician advocacy. She herself is not a doctor and we couldn't do it without her. Um, I mean, I guess in theory we could, but she's been a huge thing for physicians. Um, I think it takes so many people. It takes business people. It takes, you know, gosh, I'd love to get someone involved in the insurance industry. I'd love to get someone involved in especially the hospital systems where doctors aren't even allowed to own hospitals. So we need as many people on our side as possible for sure. And, um, and really just understanding not just what it takes to be a doctor, but why we do this and, and what's best for the patient. Um, I don't think most people understand that doing what's best for the patient is first on our list list as physicians and don't really quite understand how business uh, needs to be not just business for physicians. Right, right. And I think that to some degree, we need to shed our, <clears throat> shed that humility sometimes to just take on, you know, that advocacy role and partner up with others because we do need to take medicine back in ways that I think many of us never imagined we would need to take medicine back. You know, you sort of go into medicine just thinking that it's such an amazing field and it's all going to be paid for you and you're going to go through the steps. And then everything's just going to fit into place. And I think nowadays, especially, we're finding that things are not fitting into place. And again, sadly, that's where we're getting some of those suicides and such, where people are just like, this isn't just not working for me, but I can no longer live in this way, um, having become what I have and having nobody like advocate for me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Do you think that You know, do you think that physician suicides being on the rise is something that we can somehow address and fix, um, especially through entrepreneurship? I do. Um, Like many of the other things we spoke about, there aren't one size fits all. Um, It's also multifactorial. Um, I believe mental health in general in our country is just not doing well. So, yes, I think private practice is one potential uh, for really improving that. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to dig into the data on how many physician suicides were um, were doctors in private practice versus hospital employed doctors. And, and then even digging into that more, not just by specialty, but were they the practice owner? Was the practice doing well? Did they use, you know, how did they market their practice? What were their stresses? I mean, I think there's so many um, ways that we can go with this. Um, that I think could be huge. Um, the other thing that probably we need more than anything is community. Um, I don't necessarily think that Facebook groups are the best community. I think they're definitely better than what we have without, but, um, you know, like just thinking through where I live, we have a lady docs group and we have get togethers and we know each other. And so when we do those get togethers, it's nice to have that community and to have that support and have our backs, Um, so I think community building, not just for physicians, but just in general, same thing with my neighborhood. Um, I'm passionate about community, so I may be part of, (laughs) I make the neighborhood get togethers because I want to be part of a community, but I think that's important for, um, mental health in general, and especially for physicians. And I think another thing that's so important is vulnerability. I mean, we need to be able to be vulnerable. I can't tell you how many times I've said to doctors, um, you know, it really is hard for me when, you know, you know, whatever, I'll give plenty of examples, but when I don't get to do this or I have to do that. And the doctor will say, gosh, I didn't, you know, thank you for saying that. I've never, never heard anyone say that before. And I think part of, um, part of our issues as humans is that we don't, um, we don't really 
tell people our struggles and, you know, we look on social media and everyone looks so happy and so wonderful when really, you know, we're not, we're human, we have lives. Uh, but I think it's important for us to share that vulnerability and um, make it okay to say, hey, I'm not okay, you know? Absolutely, totally. And I know that, you know, there are doctors that are putting their foot forward and building spaces where we can connect. I mean, quick shout out to just even Diana Londonio that hopped on a, actually the So Me Docs conversation series and we spoke about one of her articles, we dissected it, but she's got a physician coaching support group that's free to doctors, which is fantastic. Um, there's also a physician anonymous group where literally the physician is anonymous. He actually hopped on a Somedox conversation too. I'll link both of those in the show notes, but um, where he appeared anonymously, like he uses a, an old photo, um, not of himself um, to represent himself. And I think he even pitched um, giving a lecture, submitting a lecture, I mean, um, giving a lecture in one of our conferences, <laughs> where again, he's going to appear anonymously. So that's like an interesting perspective. And I don't know, there's something interesting about it. Um, but I'm very thankful for the doctors that are putting their foot forward and, and generating resources to that end. Um, yeah, it's certainly a topic that needs more attention. So to summarize, um, in terms of our private practice conference, I'm so excited that it's coming up. Um, what are you looking forward to most in discussing, uh, dis what, what are you looking forward to most to discuss in the private practice event? Do I have to pick one? Oh, <laughs> no, you don't. Yeah, you know, I, everyone, I everyone. We'll be good. We'll be good organizers. We're looking forward I, to everybody. Oh man. Well, the first speaker I'm probably the biggest fan of. So much of a fan that I married him. So <laughs> maybe that would be the one that I'm most excited about. <laughs> I love that. And I had a feeling you were gonna say that. <laughs> of course, Dr. Hawkman's uh, speaking about her psychiatrist husband. So yes, so Mr. Dr. Hawkman will be speaking. And the reason I asked him to speak, uh, he's a he's a seasoned speaker um, and he's engaging, but he has such an interesting perspective. And if you ever want to go like very deep into something, he can go pretty deep. So I have him speaking. He has his own micro practice. So, you know, we we go there and he doesn't even know what a micro practice means until I told him. I'm like, well, someone's speaking about micro practice kind of like you have. And he says, what's a micro practice? <laughs> so um but you know he's he's kind of going to be starting off the lectures on why we haven't started practices like what is it that's keeping us back from conferences so sorry so what is it that's keeping us back from starting our own practice um and you know I've kind of told him like hey let's go dig deep into it let's this isn't like one of those coaching kind of things he's not a coach he's a psychiatrist but like let's actually understand what it is that's holding us back what are the fears and why are we giving into those fears? So that would probably be the one I'm most excited about because that's I'm really a big fun. fan girl. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And I love that we're starting out that way. And I love that you've curated in that way so that we kind of begin by identifying what's holding us back. And then maybe we can touch on that for the rest of the live event to make sure that we kind of solve those that pain point, right? We find a solution for what's keeping us back. Yeah, no, I'm excited. I thought that would be a great way to start. And then we have all the nitty gritty details. And then we end, uh, well, the very last thing is a panel with a bunch of different types of physicians. Um, but right before that, the last lecture is creating the vision for your practice. So I really liked it, you know, kind of start, why have I not started it? And then end with, okay, now I'm, I'm equipped with all of this knowledge. What do I want my practice to look like? So I'm super excited about it. I think it's going to be awesome. I really hope we see lots of people there who are interested and or curious. And really, you know, I'm hoping that um, and looking forward to seeing people's questions. I'm, I'm very excited to see what happens. And then I'm even more excited to see what happens a year later, see how many practices have maybe started out of out of the conference. Absolutely. I'm actually going to name the titles of the lectures before we go. It's just, if you're watching this, it's May 31st to June 2nd. Um, the hashtags we're using, the hashtag that we're using across social media is hashtag SoMeDocsPP. 
2024. So you can search for that hashtag to find any updates and any pearls that are shared when the event goes live. And FYI, um, we are, uh, this is going to be an evergreen conference, which means that even after June 2nd, when the conference is over, when the live part is over, you can actually still um, see the footage. You can actually access the footage by purchasing a ticket to see it. But before we go, let me just quickly read the lecture titles so that you kind of get an idea of what's going to be featured. We have Why You Might Not Start Your Practice Even Though You Want To by Dr. Daniel Hockman, Personal Financial Planning Before You, you Start uh, Your Private Practice, uh, Alyssa Chang, Dr. Alyssa Chang, she's MD, PhD, How to Launch Your Direct Specialty Care Practice by Tin Yen, she's a podiatrist, Determining the Financial Health of Your Business, David Norris, MD, MBA, how to Build a Thriving Community of Referring Practitioners, Ashley Maltz, MD, MPH. Red Flags and Legal Issues When Starting a Practice, Amanda Hill, JD. Creating and Retaining a High-Functioning Team, Terry Diebler, CMPE, COE. Why You Should Start a Practice Without Walls, Todd Stilson, MD. Personal Branding and Marketing in Medicine, me, Donna Coriel, MD. Top Billing Process Mistakes, Heather Signorelli, DO. Hope Transplant, Seven Tips for Overcoming Entrepreneurial Fears, Shane Purcell, MD. Grow Your Intimacy, Grow Your Practice, Intimate Marriage Secrets for Physicians and Private Practice, Alexander Stockwell, MD. Everything I Needed to Transform My Practice, I Learned from Cirque du Soleil, Regina S. Drews, MD, MBA. Creating a Vision and Applying It to Build Your Practice, Matthew Mintz, MD. Pitfalls to Avoid When Setting Up Your Micro Practice, Andre Leroy. MDMA, train your sniffometer to know when to make a move off ship. Brian Gantworker, MD. So we have got an incredible lineup. I just had to read all of those. And I can't wait to bring it to fruition with Dr. Laura Hockman. Dr. Hockman, anything to leave us with? Any asks, any final words? Come to the conference. It's free. The live event is free. You have nothing to lose. Absolutely. I love that. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope that you do all join us and that you tune in for other uh, entrepreneurs episodes. And if you enjoyed this uh, particular show, this particular episode, please share it so that more people can hear that it exists and that more people can sign up for our conference, especially before it hits, because they will be able to do so live and for free. So thank you, Dr. Hoffman, for joining Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening. 